Uh, it's really a pleasure and an honor for me to be here at Jean-Pierre Labasse's, uh, well, in the vicinity of Jean-Pierre Labasse's 80th birthday. And uh, I have known him for, oh gosh, uh, well, I don't want to, 50 years, more than 50 years. Uh, uh, I, I, don't want to do any calculations, actually, during this talk. <laughs> but Jean-Pierre Jean was the uh, first person, along with uh, Michel Duflo, to present uh, Selberg's trace formula uh, with all of the details. And I have been very fortunate to be able to, with also with Langlands, to be able to continue it. So welcome. Well, I won't say welcome to your 80s, because I'm not there yet. Quite, not quite there yet, but anyway. I hope you have a, I hope you enjoy the conference and I hope you have had a very happy birthday. So um, this, I, I want to, what I'm talking about is um, conjectures, actually. Um, there's more here than I, uh, I would like to, I think in some ways what's near the end of the talk is, is at least as interesting as what's near the beginning and I would very much like to get to that. So I will, I might try to go a little fast over the beginning and would be glad to answer questions or talk with people individually after, during the week. Um, uh, also, these, this is purely conjectural. I, I, I believe in them and I hope nobody disabuses me of them today. I believe in them. Uh, but also, uh, my interest in them is uh, at least Partly, they seem, if they're correct, they seem very beautiful, but my interest is partly in also uh, proving them. They seem to be, uh, they seem to be, they seem to be very closely connected with Langland's principle of beyond endoscopy, his strategy for using the trace formula to derive the principle of functoriality. And I would argue perhaps also the principle, his other pillar of the Langlands program, the principle of reciprocity. And I might argue that these conjectures might also, even, I mean, they, they, they would have to be consequences of those two things, but uh, more broadly, they might even have to be part of the proof. It seems, I mean, maybe not, this is not the occasion to talk about such things, but it, it seems to me that uh, there's a lot of extremely interesting things to be done in that direction. It's just, uh, uh, and uh, it, it seems that uh, um, there might be one gigantic proof with, built on a, a, an enormous induction argument that would, one might hope would, many years from now, well, let's not be too pessimistic, uh, but would lead to proofs of these things. So what I want to talk about is uh, uh, the universal groups. You could say that uh, I'm, I'm interested in the universal groups from um, automorphic forms and from um, the theory of motives. I'm not an expert in certainly the second one, and uh, I, I hope uh, I mean, I've tried to learn as much as I can, and I'm, I know I've got much more to learn, but uh, they go together, and uh, it's part of the glory of mathematics, or future glory of mathematics, that they will be perhaps part of the same thing. Okay, so uh, the, the, the I'm going to try to put my talk into six sections, as you can see there. I'm afraid I've only quoted my own references, but the first two uh, are uh, 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 up on the web or my website, and the third one is a paper in preparation. All right, so motives uh, is, uh, were introduced by Grothendieck around 1965. Actually, I should be, maybe I'll stand here. Uh, motives were introduced by, motives were introduced by Grothendieck around 1965. Uh, really one of the great discoveries of all time in mathematics. And uh, they have two simultaneous roles. On one hand, they uh, can be, uh, these two roles actually also are synonymous with the two different ways that people have tried to introduce motives to try to prove their existence. One is as fundamental, build, fundamental but hidden building blocks of smooth 
projective algebraic variety. Kind of like secret uh, fundamental particle, well, fundamental particles of matter, which you can't see, but which when they put together you see, namely the algebraic variety. Uh, but they have another role, which is as a universal cohomology theory. Uh, a cohomology theory through which uh, the various uh, cohomology theories that people have discovered in algebraic geometry factor. And they, they have four or five different uh, cohomology theories. They don't seem unrelated. There's, there's uh, realizations that compare one to the other. But motives are supposed to be a universal cohomology from which all of these others are derived. All right, so um, just uh, to say a few words about this. Uh, F and Q, actually, I've got, how's my, how does the pointer work on this? As a, it's the red button. Oh, it's the red button, yes. Oh, yes. I don't see it. Oh, there it is, yes. Okay. Uh, Am I in anybody's way here? No, I'm not, no. I'll get over here. Am I in, am I in, any, am I in your way? No. So, uh, okay, so F and Q are fields of, co of characteristic zero, and we'll assume right off the bat that F is embedded in the complex numbers. Um, actually, typically F would be a number field, and typically Q would actually be just the rationals. Um, so, uh, just embed f in the complex numbers, you can uh, then talk about an algebraic variety over f and think of it as a complex variety. And um, they come, the, the idea is that they should come with two different functors. A functor from uh, smooth projective varieties uh, over f uh, gets mapped to this hypothetical category of f motives. Um, uh, uh, what we've got here are smooth projective varieties over def with coefficients defined over f. And the other one is, they, it should also, this category should also be equipped with a map, which we could call, we, call that M, we could call that M sub f, a motive uh, uh, functor. And uh, the motive category, by, by the way, should be uh, I didn't put it in, it should be a tensor category. Uh, it's an abelian category with extra structure, namely tensor products and uh, um, mappings, uh, linear mappings defined over Q. Um, and uh, so the second functor goes from this category of motives to uh, vector spaces over Q. And these two functors have the composition that uh, HB we could call it, um, the composition of these two things um, is simply the Betty singular cohomology of complex manifolds. Uh, I think I have, oh yes, no, the Betty cohomology, so it's always confusing to me. The, the algebraic variety is defined over the complex numbers, and that you get from F. With a, it's got, we suppose that F, the coefficients over which it's defined, um, uh, embedded into the complex numbers. So uh, we get two things for the price of one there. We get a variety defined over a number field, but it's also a complex variety by embedding f into uh, the complex numbers. But we get another field too, because if as a complex variety, you can talk about its Betty cohomology, and that can have any different coefficients you want. So you've got a variety defined over f, really then a complex variety, and you have Betty cohomology. And so that's um, with Q coefficients, just basic first year algebraic topology. And so the composition of those two functors is supposed to be the singular cohomology of the motives. Uh, well, I'm sorry, the, the composition of the two is just the singular, supposed to be the singular cohomology of these uh, complex non-singular manifolds. All right, all right, so um, this category, uh, this would be what uh, uh, Grotendieck worked with, uh, which he called Tanakian <coughs> categories. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, a, a tensor category with various um, 
straightforward axioms, many of them, but <laughs> it's all straightforward, but together uh, with uh, what is known as a fiber functor, a functor from this category to the complex numbers, and those two things together amount to saying, conjecturally, that this is a semi-simple, um, uh, anti, it's anti-isomorphic uh, to uh, the, um, it, uh, the uh, category, uh, I'm going to read here, I can't read it very well. So that's the, uh, um, it's the category, um, uh, uh, so the category of motives, as I, we first introduced it, uh, hypothetically, uh, has something further, a fiber functor. Uh, it, one shows that that's the case because it's got Betty cohomology, so that there's a functor from that into the vector spaces over Q. And those things together, uh, Grotendieck proved, I guess it went back to Tanaka, that those things prove that the category is the same, anti-isomorphic actually, to the category of finite dimensional rec representations of a reductive group. A reductive, it's going to have to be a pro-algebraic group, and I'm going to index it as G, F, comma, Q, uh, to keep the two fields uh, in mind, um, and it's going to be a pro-algebraic group defined over Q. So actually, I might as well assume now that F is a number field, that Q is the rational numbers, and so then this hypothetical group, script G of F, would be a group over Q uh, with a canonical mapping, because representations of Galois groups uh, uh, um, are supposed to fit into this picture, and so they would give motives. So it comes with a canonical mapping uh, into uh, the gamma of F, which I'm taking to be the a Galois group of F bar over F. What is it? This underlies, I think, the existence of this group underlies uh, uh, many of the things. I mean, it's, people can get along without it so far, but it really underlies what um, people uh, do with motives. And there's a lot of work being done on them. So what is it? A reductive algebraic group, we know about reductive algebraic groups. Um, so what is it? So let me just now recall automorphic representations. And this is a very uh, <laughs> elementary way to describe them. Uh, if Grotendieck's stuff went back to 1965, automorphic representations are due to Langlands, introduced by Langlands, uh, uh, really in the, in the general form, in 1967 with the famous letter to Ve, and um, much perhaps more influential is the second paper called Problems in the Theory of Automorphic Forms, which was published in 1990. And in that paper, he enunciated uh, really a lot of his conjectures that form the foundation of the modern theory of automorphic representations. So I'm going to copy some of the things that, that he put in that article. I'm going to give uh, an informal definition, this, uh, we, most people here know what an automorphic representation is. An informal definition of an automorphic representation, pi, uh, is, I can't read that very well, but pi ought of g is uh, an irreducible representation that occurs, it's an irreducible representation of a group, a dedelic group, GAF, um, which occurs, in, and that, that's in quotation marks, in L2 of GF modulo GA. In other words, the decomposition of L2 of GF over GA is a unitary representation of GA, uh, the, adelic, the locally compact adelic group under right translation, and it breaks up into a direct sum or direct integral of irreducible representations. And there, the point is that in Langland's theory, there is a huge amount of fundamental structure tied up in the irreducible constituents of that unitary representation. It's far from being irreducible, it's uh, highly reducible. What one is interested in is the uh, irreducible constituents. 
In fact, uh, any such pi can be, it's known, uh, well known, this was in Langland's original article, hypothetically, that it's a, a restricted direct product of representations of all of the local fields contained by completing Q at the different valuations. And uh, almost all of which, almost all of these things uh, for the group GV, yeah, GFV, almost all of which um, are um, so-called unramified representations. It's, uh, and, and the uh, property is that almost all of the constituents are of a very simple kind, the so-called unramified representations. So that's an automorphic representation. And what's particularly relevant to the data that's in an automorphic representation is the data, quite simple data as a matter of fact, that characterizes these uh, finite, infinitely many finite dimensional representations in the, repre in the automorphic representation. Okay, so now I'm just going to say a couple of schematic things about what we're dealing with here. Uh, Langlands had further conjectures in that uh, 1970 paper. Uh, it was a series of seven conjectures, and I won't review all of them, but the last two of the conjectures were uh, in the direction of attempting to classify the uh, automorphic representations. Question six was how he might try to classify the irreducible representations of the completions, GFV, and the last one was how he might try to classify at least some of the automorphic representations. Both of them, uh, it was to, in the service of these things that he introduced his famous L group. I won't describe that, but it's a, it's a, it's a dual group from the group G together with a, a semi-direct product of, of, of the Galois group. And the point was that the, the, his classification had to do with uh, homomorphisms, local in this case, or global in this case, from, uh, uh, he, inter he recalled for us, uh, for those many of us who didn't have any idea what these things were, that these groups introduced by Vey were a slight uh, generalization of class field theory, which applies to extensions, abelian extensions of Galois groups. So there's the two Galois groups. Uh, Vey groups are slightly bigger than the Galois, typically slightly bigger than the Galois groups. And uh, Langlands classified represent, conjectured that you could classify representations, local or global, by homomorphisms of these Vey groups into the complex dual group. So there, it's all in the schematic diagram there. Uh, on the left is a group that came later, a local Langlands group, uh, which is basically uh, what was called for a while the Langlands, uh, the, the Vey Deline group, but it's simply defined as the product of the local Vey group if it's an Archimedean valuation, or the product of the local Vey group with SL2 if it's a piadic valuation. That's what this is. So I've, I've written there for the local Langlands group, uh, which is well understood, um, and the hypothetical, this was, this was not introduced by Langlands, but the hypothetical, uh, uh, it wasn't even on the radar at that point, but the hypothetical global Langlands group, LF, uh, uh, the, which we can call the automorphic Galois group, uh, which was decidedly uh, not well understood. All right, so the question is, uh, this is very good if you could classify these fundamental automorphic representations in terms of a representation of some concrete group or map from some concrete group, universal group, into the associated dual group, and that's what I want to describe. Um, uh, okay, so these, um, these locally compact groups, or this is a theory of locally compact groups for all of them. Um, um, uh, uh, so, so I've written there just what I said. Um, and um, so uh, the local, locally compact, so, so what I want to do is to describe a conjectural version of that group in the lower left hand corner. And these locally compact groups are ingredients then of a conjectured classification of the irreducible representations of GFV 
at, uh, the local groups and the corresponding automorphic representations. And again, I'm just going to do a schematic uh, drawing of how you would conjecturally construct this automorphic Galois group. Um, it's got to have two ingredients. One is a series of indices that are going to index a, uh, a direct product. Um, and uh, these indices consist of pairs. G, where G, where you're going to restrict G, G is to be a quasi-split, simple, simply connected group over F. And C is going to be a family defined of, of uh, objects defined for almost all V. Uh, it's to be a concrete datum. Uh, each of these ZVs, CVs, is to be a, the, the concrete data uh, attached. So it's two things. Uh, it's a concrete data attached to an automorphic representation of G. So G is, um, uh, yes, I'm sorry. So, so um, two things, a group G and a data defined for almost all uh, v. And the data is the set of conjugacy classes uh, in the local Langlands L groups uh, um, uh, that classify, <laughs> I'm not reading my notes very well, it's a concrete data attached to a primitive automorphic representation pi of GA. So this data G and all of these families of conjugacy classes are attached to a primitive automorphic representation of GA. What do I mean by a primitive automorphic representation of a group, of an adelic group? I mean an automorphic representation which is not, and I'm, I'm now assuming that you're a little bit familiar with Langland's main conjecture, the principle of functoriality that maps representations of one group to representations of another group. And a primitive automorphic representation I'm going to take uh, informally as an automorphic representation uh, which is not a proper functorial image of any smaller group. It's an automorphic representation that if you're familiar with endoscopy, it doesn't have any endoscopy. And uh, another condition which is essentially equivalent to this, it's a, you can put that as a condition that it's order of L function, uh, L pi R for every finite dimensional representation R of the L group uh, at S equals one is as small as it could possibly be for every R. I'm assuming that the data, so I want to have data that characterize these uh, objects and those these are supposed to be very concrete. These are supposed to be the con conjugacy classes, one for every uh, valuation V, uh, almost every valuation V in the uh, Langlands L group. And I'm assuming, I've never, I haven't proved this, but I'm expecting it to be true or almost true. If you're given such a family of conjugacy classes for a primitive representation, then they determine the Archimedean components of the constituents of the, of the representation and the complementary components at the other finite, ramified finite primes. So I, want to, I would like to phrase everything in terms of this very concrete set of data. So given those data, I hope I haven't, I've, I mean, I've just, that's a big step, but I've just sort of said that that's what they are. Given those uh, objects, then what you can do is you can, uh, they, they would come with maps uh, of the local Vey group, uh, the local Langlands group. It's supposed to come uh, because these, uh, this primitive automorphic representation should have local components. Uh, it's, there, there should be, uh, its components should be classified by representations of local Vey groups or Vey Deline groups. So, um, uh, so uh, this group would be um, uh, equipped with homomorphisms, embeddings of the local Langlands group into LF. And the 
global Bay group uh, in uh, uh, mapping, I'm sorry, mapping to the local Langlands group uh, and the global Langlands group. I'm sorry. <laughs> It's just what I've written there. It, it comes with embeddings of uh, 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 maps from the local VE group into LF, uh, which extend the maps of the local VE groups uh, of FV into WF. Uh, by the way, uh, it, so it's supposed to be a lo it would be a locally compact group, and I've given its formula up there. It is a fiber product of all of these groups, LC, LC is the, um, uh, I'm sorry, I missed something here. Um, the, the first ingredient uh, is, uh, the, is the data. The second ingredient is that for every one of these data C, there is a group LC, which is supposed to be an extension of the global VE group by a compact simply connected group. And the compact simply connected group is uh, uh, simply a compact real form of the simply connected cover, not of the Langlands dual group, but of the uh, um, uh, simply connected cover of the Langlands dual group um, I'm sorry, the, if the group G is simply connected, the Langlands dual group, and by calling it a dual group, I'm talking about the group part of the Langlands L group, which is a semi-direct product, G hat. If G is simply connected, Langlands definition would make G hat an adjoint group. So you take that adjoint group, and then you take its uh, simply connected cover. So G hat simply connected, is like G, simply connected complex group, but it's on the dual side. And so what comes with that, it's a natural thing that uh, is not hard to define with this, is, a, is a, an extension of the global VE group by this uh, very concretely given uh, compact simply connected group. It's not a semi-direct product, it's an actual extension. I don't know if that's a very special case of what people call uh, uh, what are those things? Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, anyway, it's, I'll just leave it like that. Um, um, and so then given those extensions, LC mapping into the global VE group, you can simply take their product. I want it to be locally compact, so I'm going to have to actually take a fiber product because the, the VE group is not compact, it's locally compact, so I take a fiber product of all of those things over the global VE group. I should, by the way, say that the principle of functoriality, uh, that, uh, tells you about, that tells you that the global L functions that Langlands defined, which are uh, attached to a family of conjugacy classes and a representation of the dual group, um, uh, his principle of functoriality, which I'm not describing formally, but it does include a proof that these things have analytic continuation and functional equation, and uh, this uh, is necessary for both of those two uh, uh, properties that I would use to define um, a primitive representation. So it depends on the principle of functoriality, which is one of the pillars of the Langlands program, and um, that then is supposed to be the automorphic Galois group. It's a locally compact group, very concrete, I would argue, um, built out of automorph certain of the automorphic representations, and ve but uh, very simple data attached to those automorphic representations, the uh, cofinite family of Hecke eigenvalues. Uh, so now I'll just say in that thir third paper, the, the first, the, the, the two papers when I talked about the work of Grothendieck and the work of Langlands, uh, uh, they, they refer, they refer to their, the references for those would be the first two papers I had. The third paper that's under preparation is something here, and it is that uh, there's, a, there's, there's an identity. I mean, it's conjectural, but there's an identity 
uh, that, map, that matches what happens for vague groups. Namely, Q is a bigger field, F is a field of uh, a finite extension of Q. Uh, there's an embedding of L of F into LQ, the quotient of which is bijective with the quotient of the A group with, uh, um, I'm sorry, this uh, should be the local, this should be, the LF should not be the Langmans group, this is the local A group. LQ over LF is bijective with WQ over WF, which in turn is bijective with gamma Q, the Galois groups over gamma of F, which is in turn bijective with homomorphisms, Q homomorphisms of F into F bar, or the complex numbers. This is something, if you look in Tate's article about Vey groups, probably the best reference for Vey groups, it's the first article in volume two of the Corvallis Proceedings. This is right, not the one on the left, but this thing here on the right is, is right on the first page of his article. But this is, is, seems very interesting. Uh, this thing is based on a paper. Uh, it's, it's, one could just conjecture this is true, but actually one can calculate this, in a, at least in the case of GLN. And what one would use to calculate it is a recent paper of Clozel and Rajan called base change, solvable base change for GLN. And so this question here actually is, is closely related to base change. So it, might, it suggests that it might have, it should have appli further applications. Okay, so here's, here's what you would expect of these groups. Um, there's a bijection uh, from irreducible representations. LF's a locally compact group, so you can talk about irreducible continuous representations of that into GLNC, and that should be bijective with cuspidal automorphic excuse me, automorphic representations of GLN. These would be n-dimensional, yeah, uh, that they should be the bijective with cuspidal automorphic representations of GLNA. A more general assertion would be that um, uh, there's a general mapping from uh, what we could call Langlands parameters, namely uh, homomorphisms up to conjugacy, or up to, uh, I won't, describe the exact uh, conditions there to satisfy, but homomorphisms from the Langlands group into the L group of G, um, and sets, which I'm writing as pi sub phi, uh, um, sets of automorphic, tempered automorphic representations of G uh, for any uh, uh, quasi-split group, not necessarily primitive, it's not, not necessarily simply connected, but any quasi-split group, and this would go from bounded global Langlands parameters, but now defined with respect to this automorphic Galois group, to a disjoint, to dis disjoint L packets uh, whose, uh, uh, whose union is the set uh, of tempered automorphic representations of GA. That's what you would hope that this Langlands group satisfies. All right, so now that's the automorphic. This is, this, it seems, I'm not sure that I've explained it in this clear enough way. I'm having trouble reading my own notes, but that's what you would expect, uh, I think, conjecturally, of this concrete, of this group, quite concrete, this automorphic Langland, uh, automorphic Galois group. Now the reason for doing that, well, of course, we like automorphic representations, so it uh, certainly makes sense to have if, if you want to classify automorphic representations, but another reason for doing it is to understand uh, its relationship to motives. And I'm just going to write down, I don't have time to go through, whoops, the details, but uh, what should happen uh, the construction of LF, the local, the global Langlands group, automorphic Langlands group, uh, is a complex uh, pro-algebraic, uh, I'm sorry, the construction of LF leads to a complex pro-algebraic group GF, depending on the embedding of F into C, uh, with uh, homomorphisms, just the sort of natural things that you would expect, uh, 
uh, well, a whole morphism of the Langlands group um, into GF. GF is supposed to now be a complex group, and, uh, it's the, and there should be a homomorphism of this complex group into GF, uh, which extends the homomorphism of the global V group into another group. Uh, this is new as well, uh, or was new in 1977. It's a group defined by Langlands, which he called the Tanyama group. Uh, it's basically uh, an abelian, uh, an extension of the Galois group by uh, Taurus, an abelian group. It's supposed to account for the uh, representations, automorphic re representations, which um, um, or the mo uh, motives which have complex multiplication. And it's a very precise definition of Langlands, not conjectural. Uh, it's the Langlands Tanyama group from the proceedings uh, of the Corvallis conference. Roughly speaking, it's the algebraic hull, uh, whatever that means, taking a locally compact group and making it into a larger algebraic group. But the uh, algebraic hull of a, a subgroup of the global V group, what you could call the motivic part of the global V group or the part of the global they group that's attached to uh, complex multiplication. And this thing, well, this is more complicated. It's a fiber product of complexifications, G sub C of this uh, L, of uh, um, uh, the L, these groups L sub, C, I'm sorry, it's a complexification G sub C um, of the, Uh, I'm sorry, this is, um, that, that G is supposed to be a C. I guess it's a C. Uh, so G, these are complexifications G sub C um, of L, G sub C of L sub C. Remember we defined L sub C and put that into a, a fiber product. So each of these groups, we complexify them. Well, we have a, compa a complex, a, a compact group K sub C, and you just take its complexification. That's what this means. But what you really do is you restrict the number of data that you put into the product. These, I'm going to, I'll call these C sub F hod. Uh, this C sub F is the, is the data set. And so these are the uh, set of data that are of Hodge type. In other words, uh, such that uh, R, for every finite dimensional representation, of this uh, locally compact group LC into some general linear group. And for every pi, uh, for every V in S infinity, infinite valuation, the restriction of R to the subgroup C star. R is a map of the uh, Archimedean V group and its uh, connected component is C star. You can restrict it to that. You can see what you get within the V group. Um, the Archimedean V group, and then uh, think of what the, is in L sub C, and um, you then take its image under a finite dimensional representation, and then you're, get, you're getting a mapping of uh, C star into um, uh, GLNC, and you ask that it be of Hodge type. That basically means that the parameters of uh, this map of C star don't have any uh, imaginary part. They're just, uh, they have integral, just have integral real parts. Um, or in, uh, integral, I'm not gonna define a Hodge structure, but it's a, it's a very natural uh, condition. And you simply restrict yourself to define this uh, automorphic Galois group. You simply restrict yourself to uh, those um, indices which are of Hodge type in this very precise uh, fashion. And uh, then uh, that's what this global group, this global automorphic group should be. It's a complex group uh, with a co uh, that maps into this Tanya, the set of complex points. The Tanyama group was actually defined over Q, but this is to be regarded as a set of complex, group of complex points in the Tanyama group, which in turn maps onto the Galois group. Now I've said the automorphic Galois group is supposed to be defined over Q, not over the complex numbers. So what I really mean by this is 
the, this is the set of this should be the set of complex points in the automorphic uh, in the motivic Galois group. So again, I uh, if I put on my glasses, I can read my own notes better. Um, uh, this is is. Um, This is meant to be rather, I mean, the big deal is in the conjectures. It's not in the, uh, it's not in the construction. The construction should be pretty, uh, should be, I think, regarded as pretty simple and, and, uh, and explicit. Uh, but in any case, that's the conjecture. That would be the conjecture of the complex points in the, in the automorphic Galois group. All right, so then what you would get is by, by restricting these indices C and by complexifying the groups uh, up there, the C, the G sub C, you again, you just take a, a fiber product of all of these things uh, over, well, you wouldn't take it over the Vey group, you'd take it over this algebraic group, uh, the Tanyama group. But same thing, and it's not a it's not actually a product because that was what, that's what would give you a locally, gave us the locally compact group, but it's a pro-algebraic fiber product and you, what you get is a pro-algebraic uh, reductive group over C. And again, it comes with these local embeddings. Now this would be, uh, I guess, I, I hope I've made it clear enough to say that this would, especially if you know about the properties of automorphic L functions, uh, that th this would be a general form of the Shimura Tanyama Vey conjecture, um, uh, which uh, uh, is known. Uh, Langlands introduced, I think, this general form. He had a version of this uh, automorphic Langlands group and automorphic Galois group, but it was much coarser than the one we're talking about here. But um, it uh, this general form of the shimura tanyama Bay conjecture can be regarded as what's known as Langland's uh, principle, not of functoriality, but as principle of reciprocity, whose proof, uh, we can hope, or I, I hope anyway, uh, perhaps, uh, no, let's not put a perhaps in it. I hope that its proof uh, will be tied up in, in the proof, future proof, well into the future, of Langland's principle of functoriality, his other, uh, the other pillar of the Langlands program. And let me just say a couple of properties of this group, uh, conjectural properties of this group that uh, I haven't written out all of the details, but uh, uh, you should be able to prove from the definition I have, the Q structure. I'm saying it's, it's supposed to be an algebraic group over Q, not over the complex numbers, but for each G sub C uh, uh, that parameterizes a factor, um, uh, an explicit Q structure, conjecturally, on the complex group GC. I, uh, that is to say, for which GC is the group of complex points underlying a given Q structure. So the point is that there's an explicit way to describe what its Q structure should be in terms of the data that we have used to construct the group. Secondly, cohomological realizations of this. I haven't proved them all or checked them all, but what you would like is a conjectural description of the cohomology groups for different uh, theories, uh, for motives and algebraic varieties. There's five or six different cohomology groups, the uh, Duran cohomology, l cohomology, uh, things I don't like to understand less. Uh, 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 crystalline cohomology, Hodge, Hodge cohomology, uh, all of those things uh, should be obtainable in explicit terms from this group. And so at least some of them I've checked, uh, where, where I, well I haven't written out all the details, but I believe you can calculate in terms of the explicit structure of this group. And finally what are known as motivic periods. And this is in the special case of a relation between the Betty realization and the Duram realization, the maps of the motivic Galois group into the Betty cohomology and into the Duram cohomology. An explicit conjectural description um, 
of the Betty cohomology. So I've written it there. It's it's uh, it's the Betty cohomology by definition is um, well. It's uh, attached. Uh, the, these things are attached to what I will call a motive. And now in this context, we've got a motive is simply a finite dimensional representation of this group. And so you want to be able to say for any motive, any finite dimensional representation of this group, I don't need to write these things down. We're talking about a group of a product of simply connected groups. We know what their representations are. I'm cheating a bit. I mean, you've got the, got the Tanyama group there too. But I mean, these are, this is a group you could hope to write down in some fashion as representations, finite dimensional representations. And in other words, motives. So for every motive, there's, uh, uh, by definition actually, uh, uh, a representation over Q of that group uh, should be uh, the, the Betty, uh, by definition, the Betty realization. Uh, that's, this should be the Betty cohomology of whatever, of the motive underlying this map. In other words, possibly an algebraic variety. This should be the Betty cohomology with something different, the Duram cohomology attached to M. That's different. But you could, I think, write down that also explicitly in terms of uh, the group and uh, write down an explicit isomorphism uh, from uh, the tensor product of the Duram cohomology. And now I'm thinking of the Duram cohomology as a vector space with coefficients in F, not in C. For motives or algebraic varieties, that was a, a theorem of Grothendieck that you could always write Duram cohomology, or the, the uh, differential forms, a, a priori defined over the complex numbers, you could always uh, write them in a way, uh, of defined over the f field of definition, this number field F, say, um, in such a way that the uh, Duram cohomology is preserved. So, so this would be, a, this is an explicit description of a vector space over F, Oh, and then uh, this is a vector space over C. In each case, you take the tensor product with C, this one uh, relative to F and this one over C. And so there's an explicit isomorphism between two n by n complex vector spaces. And so if F equals Q, uh, omega m, this homomorphism, can be expressed as a complex square matrices. And it's the, ver it's the indices of this matrix that are called the periods of uh, the motive. And they, that's a whole other theory which seems to be absolutely uh, fascinating. Um, you would like to, uh, periods uh, and motives. Periods are, there's a beautiful article by Zagier and uh, Kuntsevich called periods of all things. And it explains that any number that you might have seen in calculus like, uh, uh, a definite integral that you think should have an explicit formula, and it doesn't have an explicit formula. Or like the sum, the zeta of three. You'd think that, well, you were perhaps were told that it has an explicit formula. What about zeta of, uh, excuse me, zeta of two? Uh, what about zeta of three, zeta of four? They all should have explicit formulas. Well, this is a theory. Periods are these things. Any formula that is given by an integral of differential forms over the rational numbers with entries that are defined over the rational numbers, domains defined by the rational numbers, that's a definition of a period. And this is a theory, and this is a theory that uh, relates all periods, conjecturally, to motives. And uh, specifically, the periods are like uh, algebraic numbers and the motives are the motivic Galois group taken, taking its Q points is like the Galois group. And the motivic Galois group over Q acts on the uh, algebra of these periods. And it's just a, a magnificent thing, I think. This, these have been around for a long time. Uh, I don't know if Kunsevich was the person that introduced them. But in any case, at least in this case, uh, one, I think, gets a, an explicit way to describe the, the periods. Okay, so now um, I want to do two extensions. Mixed motives. Uh, mixed motives, um, there should be a, an extension of this group. 
uh, I'm right, I'll write it as GF plus. It should be a semi-direct product of GF with a unipotent group NF defined over uh, Q, uh, sorry, defined over F. Um, and that would be the mixed motivic, what's known as the mixed motivic Galois group. And it would play the same role that the motivic Galois group plays, but not for non-singular uh, uh, projective varieties, but arbitrary varieties over Q. And the problem would be to find an explicit conjectural construction of the unipotent radical NF as a pro-unipotent algebraic group over Q. And it's got to come with a Q action of GF too, because this is a semi-direct product. This, it's a, this is a unipotent group. It's its unipotent radical, and this uh, semi-simple part's got to act on this linear, linearly. So what would that be? Um, um, well, uh, it turns out that there's a um, conjecture of uh, uh, Balenson that tells you a lot, an awful lot about this group, and um, in some sense it reduces it to studying the, a little piece of the unipotent radical, namely you take its Lie algebra and then you take the commutator quotient of that. That's a vector space over Q and uh, this is supposed to have an action, a linear action of uh, this uh, motivic Galois group GF and um, supposed to have a linear action of this. Well now GF is built out, roughly speaking, of a product of simply connected uh, groups. We know, as I said before, we know about the representations of simply connected groups. We're we talking here about representations defined over Q, but that's not a serious matter, I think. And uh, you'd also have to in, uh, incorporate it with how it goes together with the Tanyama group, that abelian, that torus. But in principle, we sort of would understand how to write those things down. And then what we're talking about is um, this uh, thing, this thing here, this NF, it's an infinite dimensional uh, pro uh, uh, vector space, but it's got to have a decomposition into irreducible representations of the group we've just defined. What are they? What are their, what ones occur and what are their multiplicities? Uh, well, we'd, this is a group that you're given. It's not a group you get to make up. This is a group you're given. This N, F, uh, A, B, that's given to you. That's for the mixed motivic Galois group. Uh, so you're not given that. What you're given, it's kind of like knowing, trying to ask about automorphic representations if you know all of their irreducible, if you can classify the irreducible constituents. It's sort of we're thinking, well, we can classify all the possible finite dimensional representations of the motivic Galois group but then we don't know what this vector space is. So what you would need for that is the multiplicities. If you can write down all of these, um, if you can write down all of these representations, we're talking about just knowing their multiplicities. And that's what's wrapped up in the conjectures of Valenson, Deligne, Bloch, and, and a number of other people. That's what we would need to understand, uh, which I don't say I understand, I don't understand it at all. I'm hoping to write a, paper on the subject with a student who knows these things, he's learned these things very well and he's already taught me what little I know about them. Anyway, uh, so in other words, I'll express, uh, just say a project would be to express this answer explicitly in terms of irreducible representations of the simply connected uh, complex groups, G hat simply connected uh, in the factors of GC. So, uh, I, that's a project maybe you could ask of yourselves and any, anybody is welcome to try to do it given what I've said. Um, uh, you could then describe NF explicitly uh, as, a, as it would be a free pro-unipotent group with an action of GF over Q and the reason for that is that uh, there's a conjecture of Balenson that says that all of the higher extensions of any motive and uh, the vector space Q um, uh, vanish for I bigger than, greater than or equal to two. So that, uh, if, I guess if one sorts that out, that tells you how to write 
all the components of the unipotent radical if you can figure out what it is on, the, um, on this vector space. I should also say that uh, we, well, if you had that, you could have an explicit conjectural construction of the mixed motific Galois group. So uh, in any case, I should say that the conjectures of Balenson contain more than just the multiplicities. It gives you the structure of the relevant X1 groups as, as finite abelian groups. And that gives you more information, not just the structure of the group, but actually bears a lot on the uh, periods that you, these would now be mixed motivic periods. All right. Could you say again uh, what this conjecture should imply? In terms of Pardon me? Could you explain again why you mentioned this, this uh, conjecture about the vanishing of x? <laughs> it, it, uh, x bigger than 1, it implies that the group NF is free. It's a free unipotent group, which I gather is, a, is a, uh, something that's been studied, like a free group. And it, it's, it basically tells you how to write it down explicitly, as a, it would, in this case, as a, G, as a GF module, uh, if you know what happens to its commutator quotient. Um, OK, so uh, <coughs> all right, so here's something. <laughs> Sorry, but I really think this next thing is very interesting. It's uh, what are called exponential motives. This is an important generalization of motives. Uh, why? There are some periods that don't, I, I said what periods are, but there are some periods that don't occur in this way. Uh, e, the number E, is, uh, it ought to be a period. It's not a rational number. It ought to be a period. It's not. Uh, Euler's constant, gamma, that's a, that's a nice number from undergraduate days. It ought, to be, um, it ought to be a period, it's not. However, these things turn out, and a whole bunch of others, they tend to turn out to be a, a generalization of motives, which are called exponential motives. That's one thing. Secondly, uh, it's needed, exponential motives are needed for fundamental physics. Uh, 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 work of Kunsevich and Soibelman, which is posted, I think they have three papers which study uh, exponential motives in terms of really fundamental questions involving Feynman diagrams and Feynman integrals. Uh, and third, well, here's a more concrete thing. It plays the role, these things play the role in linear differential equations of um, differential equations with ir irregular singular points, whereas ordinary motives uh, are ir uh, differential equations with regular singular points. So this is, this is when you start to use maybe geometric Langlands and you're talking about their differential equations. Uh, in any case, uh, 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 in any case, they give these hypothetical, um, uh, these hypothetical exponential motives. Uh, they were in, the notion was introduced by Deline in some form in a letter to Malgrange in the 1970s. Then Katz, Bloch, Eno made contributions to these things, these regular, irregular singular points. And then there is a beautiful paper on the web that's quite recent. Not, it's a book, but it's not quite finished, by Frassan and Yosin. And unlike, for me anyway, papers in this area, which I found quite difficult to read, this uh, is very complex and very uh, beautiful, it seems, but it's, it's nicely written. Okay, in any case, you would, you would get an extension of these motivic Galois groups. Okay, uh, basic idea, uh, I'm, I'm, I think I, do I have five minutes? I, I'm, I think I've got a couple of minutes. What do I have? I'm, this is not a negotiation. It's, just, just tell me what, five minutes. Five minutes. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, uh, um, there's, the basic idea is that exponential motives, instead of talking about Betty cohomology of algebraic varieties, it's another kind of cohomology, which is a generalization, and it's attached to not different, not, not, not uh, uh, algebraic varieties, but so-called algebraic varieties with potential, a pair consisting of an algebraic variety together with a regular function on the variety. Um, 
And it's uh, out of that you can get, by, there's a formula that you can define a generalization of Betty cohomology, uh, which is called the cohomology of rapid decrease. And it's a dual would be uh, called the cohomology, Betty cohomology of cohomology. This is homology and Betty cohomology of rapid decrease and uh, rapid decay. And there's also a Durham cohomology group. And there is also, uh, just like we had before, uh, an isomorphism between Durham cohomology as a f vector space, tensor with C, and uh, Betty co rapid decrease cohomology tensored with Q. And that's where you get the rest of the exponential periods. They all, they come from that. And so one would like to have an explicit description of the exponential Galois group. If you had, an, if you had a description of that, uh, well, you'd perhaps want an automorphic version of it. Uh, what could that possibly be? We've already used up all of the automorphic representations. What could it possibly be? Um, okay, do not look at the last line. Problem, uh, I'm hiding it for myself, but not for you. Find an explicit conjectural construction of G tilde hat, uh, like that of G. For this, you would need, you do, you'd want some version of the shimura tanyama A conjecture, so you'd want an automorphic version of it. What could it possibly be? We've already used up all the automorphic representations. Well, okay, so I'm a little hesitant to say this because nobody has ever made this conjecture. I, I think I've never seen it before, which makes me a little dubious because I think it's, you know, <laughs> if it's true, other people would have noticed it. I mean, Deline particularly has worked on both sides of the question, so I hope I'm not just handing you complete nonsense. But I, I, it just seems there can be nothing else. It's got to come from automorphic representations uh, of Balin's and Deline extensions. In other words, motive, uh, uh, um, the gen generalizations of uh, uh, metaplectic representations. Uh, <clears throat> in other words, topological covering groups, G tilde of A, of, of G A. And that's a, uh, that's, people have studied that, and, uh, but it's, it seems to me a much bigger field than it's perhaps been given credit for. It makes automorphic representations like a special case. There's all kinds of these extensions, and uh, which uh, the only thing that's really been done in this thing is Wen Wei Li has a very nice uh, paper on the, uh, on the invariant trace formula for metaplectic groups. That's kind of like the first case of uh, these uh, topological automorphic forms of these topological uh, uh, extension groups. And so the, I, there might even be, Berlinski and Berlin have described these extent, a bunch of these extensions in algebraic terms, and they're the things that one should certainly start with. And uh, so it's, it's really a, a whole uh, stuff. And so it's, it's, it's these metaplectic representation, automorphic representations and their generalizations, which in my opinion should, uh, I hope, uh, account for exponential motives, which are clearly important. Um, so thank you. <laughs>